the most recent obstacle placed in the path of the intelligent design movement and creationism in general is the ruling that Judge John Jones handed down in Kitzmiller versus Dover Area School District. That ruling was handed down on December 20th, 2005. Judge Jones recognized really every aspect of the intelligent design movement that it was important for him to recognize. He understands that it's religion. He recognized that. He understood that it's creationism in disguise, just with slightly new clothes, new terminology. And he recognized how they are shifting their language. That's in his decision. Um, he also recognized something else very important. He recognizes the historical context out of which intelligent design grew, that it came directly out of the creation science movement, that their arguments are the same. They've made a few cosmetic changes. They've gotten rid of uh, the far out claims like the young age of the earth. But Judge Jones recognized that we're simply dealing with a new version of creationism. And he really threw the book at these people. And it's going to be very hard for them to get over this obstacle in the sense that he issued such a strong opinion that it's going to serve as a legal guidepost for any other judge that has to make a decision on, in future court cases. Uh, what the intelligent design movement would really love to have is a, and what they've been trying to get is a, a court case, a lawsuit, in an area where they think they really own the judges and where they have control over the, the pro-intelligent design players in the lawsuit and where they control the terminology. But Judge Jones has placed a big obstacle in front of them because he recognized how they're sanitizing their terminology. They're now presenting themselves as people who want to teach more about evolution. They just want to teach the strengths and weaknesses of evolution. They want to teach the evidence against evolution. They want to teach the controversy about evolution that supposedly exists among scientists. They want to teach all of the, everything except intelligent design, supposedly except that Judge Jones in Kitzmiller versus Dover Area School District saw through all of those linguistic subterfuges and really put a block in front of them. I think any other judge that has to rule on an intelligent design case, it, the first thing he's going to do or she will read Judge Jones's ruling. I think a good question to consider is what tactics the intelligent design creationist movement is using in order to advance, advance their goals and how those tactics are being felt at ground level, how the influence of the intelligent design movement is playing out on the ground in schools, for example, in classrooms and even in homes. What we're seeing, and we've been seeing this for a number of years now, is that the intelligent design movement has youth ministries. They work through youth ministries, college campuses. They work through churches. And these are, this is the grassroots. And so we now have parents training their children to walk into their public school science classes and challenge their teachers. There's a list of 10 questions that they can get from the intelligent design movement and go down the list and start challenging, challenging their teachers um, with creationist talking points in science class. This is already happening. Young people at times are, I think, creating very difficult conditions for their teachers in class. If, even if you have a strong teacher, this discourages the teacher from even, even teaching about evolution. If you have a, a teacher who's weak on the science, who is underprepared, that teacher is going to look like a fool in front of her own students. They don't know how to answer these questions. They don't know the issue. They haven't spent time learning about creationism. They've been trying to learn science in order to teach it. And so you've got some 15-year-old with acne telling you how to understand what you teach or challenging what you teach. And this is what's happening. This is how the intelligent design movement is playing itself out on the ground. You even have students who talk to school boards. So this is having a very chilling effect on science teaching at the grassroots level.
What I've been doing uh, in this issue is documenting with empirical data the nature of the intelligent design movement, what its goals are, bringing to bear on this question what they themselves have said, how they've described what they do, their own movement. The other thing I've done is to provide philosophical analysis of some of their claims. The groups in the United States who are pushing creationism, trying to get it into public schools, specifically into the science classes, are the groups that I would classify collectively as the religious right. And the intelligent design creationist movement is another column in the religious right. So when I say religious right, I'm talking about creationists, like the ones at the Discovery Institute, the intelligent design creationists. I'm talking about the young earth creationists who have had to hitch themselves to the, to the wagon of intelligent design because they know that they don't stand a chance of doing this as young earthers. I'm talking about people who have given the intelligent design movement a great deal of support and who already have a great deal of political momentum of their own, people like James Dobson of Focus on the Family, D. James Kennedy of Coral Ridge Ministries, Phyllis Schlafly, Eagle Forum, uh, Beverly LaHaye, Concerned Women for America, and anybody else like, like these people I've named who are advancing a very hard right religious agenda with the use of politics. Uh, collectively, we call them the Christian right or the religious right. If you compare getting knowledge by relying on authorities uh, with getting it scientifically, using scientific methodology, you have in one case where the person is doing his own thinking, because what I think what a lot of people don't understand is that what scientists do, the methodology they use, and the types of reasoning they use are really not unique to science. They weren't even invented by scientists. What scientists have done is to take the successful methodologies and ways of reasoning that people have always used to solve practical problems and to develop explanations you know, for questions that they had, and to apply them to the study of nature. That, that's, so scientific reasoning is not even unique. We all do it every day. If you rely on an authority or an authoritative source or an authoritative person for knowledge, you're essentially not having to think at all. You're letting someone else do your thinking for you. And if you don't know anything about how scientific reasoning works or even about how good critical thinking works in any area, you don't really know whether what you're getting from this authority is reliable. And so it's very dangerous simply to rely on authoritative sources, surely by virtue of, by the power of their authority for what you think you need to know. Critical thinking in the most general sense means being able to think about your own thinking, to be able to evaluate it, analyze it, know whether you're doing it correctly. There are the nuts and bolts that are required for critical thinking. You have to know something about the different types of reasoning that humans do, deductive reasoning, inductive reasoning. You have to know the types of arguments that are developed using those two natural types of reasoning capabilities. The other very important ingredient in critical thinking is that whatever you're doing, it has to start from a foundation of intellectual honesty and truth-telling. If you don't do it that way, then none of the arguments that you come up with are any good because all argumentative skill presupposes that you're using it uh, with true premises, that you're telling the truth in what you're conveying through your argument. And so critical thinking relies not only on knowing the, argument to, the argumentative skills involved, but also to be able to tell the difference between truth and falsity.